You suck at airway. That, that's, that's what it's really about. You suck at airway. And All right, so we suck at airway. This is just, you know, politeness. Um, it, it, th you suck at airway. That, that's, that's what it's really about. You suck at airway. Any anesthesiologists in the room? Good. So then you all suck at airway. Um, you know, the anesthesiologists, they, they have a, a pretty standardized training regimen. I live with an anesthesiologist. My wife's an anesthesiologist. And, you know, so their first year they do an insane number of laryngoscopies and they, they train on Miller and Mac and blades whose eponyms I can't remember and then they learn Glidescope and Standard and McGrath and, and they get enough intubations to learn all those various techniques. You folks in the audience, EMS, EM, critical care, you do not get enough intubations to learn multiple techniques. Your training regimen is going to be different. Your environment is going to be different. If you're trying to play the same game as the anesthesiologist, then you're going to suck at airway. Our environment is different, as I mentioned. Our patients are sicker. Critically ill patients are different. In the ORs, you remember back to your time at the beginning of your residencies or even during medical school where you know the patient would come in fasted and they'd give some medaz and they'd give a sedative agent and they'd bag for a while and make sure the patient's bagable and then they'd push the paralytic and you could try eight or ten times before that patient would desaturate. That's not our patients. Our patients don't tolerate more than one pass very well. They don't tolerate an extended time to intubation. They don't tolerate someone failing at a standard device and then moving to video to rescue it. We got to be different in our patients. We need first pass success in our patients. Second try, patients die. Now I had to put that you know, squiggly line equal sign because some idiot on Twitter is like, oh, so every time we go to two attempts they die? So, so now I, I fixed that here, just, just in case. Um, so yeah, no, not every second attempt they die. But over an average of all critical care intubations, mortality goes up sharply. Complications go up sharply on the second time. Uh, this is just one article that conglomerates a lot of literature. And you can find this all on the MCRIT site. You don't have to scribble it down. Um, but this looked at the increased complication rates in a number of studies by the time you get to just the second attempt. My friend Laura Duggan out in Canada, she looked at this as well. Market increase in complications by the time you get to the second attempt. Um, this is Tom Mort's data. Uh, he looked at greater than two. By the time you get to the third attempt, look at the sharp increases in hypoxemia and tenfold rate of cardiac arrest. So we're, we're talking about a real crucial necessity to get the job done on the first pass. And yet, you guys suck at airway. So we're, we're in a situation where our patients are sicker and you're worse. That's not a great place to be. So what's the solution? You should call anesthesia for all your intubations. All right, you laugh. You know that's not completely what I'm going to answer. So then how do we fix this circumstance? Well, what we're going for is dash 1A, which is definitive airway, sans, hypoxemia, hypotension on the first attempt. The way to get this done is not to train like the anesthesiologists do, not to learn multiple techniques, multiple devices. Oh, if I fail this, if the patient looks a certain way, I'll go for that. That's not going to work out. You, with the number of intubations you do in the ICU or ED, have the chance, the opportunity, the training regimen to learn one technique and learn it perfectly. And if you do that, then you have a shot at offering excellence in laryngoscopy for your patients. So you're not going to be competent at multiple techniques. You've got to be competent at one. Single technique mastery, which means one device every time and escalate to what you would do in the old days when you failed on the first attempt. So we're going to escalate early and we're going to use single technique mastery. Now the learning curve for intubation, this is a you know, very scientific diagram here. Um, when you really look at it in the old days, it seems like you plateau right around the 100 tube mark. But that was with a training regimen of multiple techniques and without the 
multiplicative benefits that come from learning with video devices. My belief is, if you are going with single technique and you're using video, not just for ease of intubation, but ease of learning. It dramatically increases your anatomical view. It allows you to record and review each intubation to see did you do it perfectly or not. Then we could lower this plateau and actually achieve excellence in intubation at even lower than 100 tubes. Because even 100 is really dangerous. When you look at the national airway studies of how many tubes the average ED or intensivist does a year, it's generally less than 10. So it means if you didn't get them in during your training, you're kind of hosed. So optimize each one. We're going to maximize learning, maximize reflection. All right, so that brings us to this shock trauma failed airway algorithm, which is, to my mind, the only studied airway algorithm. You'll see a bunch out there. The ASA has one. The Europeans have one. The Brits have one. None of them have been studied. The STC failed airway algorithm has been studied. This is my modification, modified based on the original with new things like video laryngoscopy and single technique mastery. So we're going to go through it real quick. All right, attempt number one, video laryngoscope with a standard geometry blade and a bougie. Attempt number one, and this is all available on the site, so you can find all this. You don't have to worry about it. I'm going to go too fast. All right, so standard geometry. What does that mean for anyone who's not familiar? Standard geometry means it's exactly the same as a Macintosh, but you're adding in the video. And since it is a Macintosh, it can be used for both direct and looking at the screen. But you're getting all the advantages of an increased view, the increased ability to see difficult airways right up front. But because it's standard geometry, you could use a bougie with it. You can't use that with the hyperangulated blades. And now bougie first intubation has been proven. Driver, Brian Driver, got an article in the JAMA for emergency airway management. That's insane. And this article showed a dramatic and significant increase in first pass success when in Hennepin they used a bougie first. So not bougie for rescue, bougie right up front. And this means you get used to using a bougie and you get good at using a bougie and then it's not, I haven't used this in 10 years and now I'm getting a failed airway. That's gonna be the first time I grab a bougie. So bougie first. This study was done um, by those EMS docs that are anesthesiologists in Europe and they had a 98% first pass success rate with standard geometry video and a bougie. You can't get better than that first pass success. So that's our first attempt. Second attempt. Figure out why you failed. If the reason you failed was inability to visualize, then the second attempt should switch to a hyperangulated blade. I don't recommend these hyperangulated blades, you know, like the standard GlideScope or the CMAC D blade for your first attempt. I know some places are doing that. I don't think that's right, and I don't think that's supported by the literature. But when you've already identified your problem is you can't visualize cords, then this is the salvage maneuver. You switch to hyperangulated. If on the other hand, your problem was that you didn't position the patient right, or they had started having some secretions that bubbled up while you're intubating, or they vomited, well, then you could go right back to what you were doing, because the reason you failed had nothing to do with the standard geometry blade and the bougie. So you're going to make that choice based on what you saw on the first attempt. Now, the problem with hyperangulated is it's a second technique. That whole manipulation of a styletted tube and all of the perturbations that go with that, well, that's problematic, because you're trying single technique mastery but you got to do it unless you get the right bougie. Now, Sharn, and I take money from no company, and especially not these bougie companies, Sharn makes a bougie that has two advantages. One, it is malleable, so you could shape it just like the hyperangulated stylet, but where this dude has his fingers, these little ridges on the screen right here, if you push up on those, the tip angulates up, and if you push down, the tip angulates down. It's a malleable tip bougie. So if you are hyperangulated and the curve you put is still not enough, you can just push down a little bit on the, those little corrugated areas and all of a sudden the tip articulates up. 20 bucks, the bougies I'm using right now are 10 bucks. So that's worth it to me for the number of intubations we do. So we're trying to get these right now. All right, third attempt. If you're at a training center, it might be a junior who's doing these first one or two attempts, depending on how sick the patient is. But third attempt should be the most skilled person in the room. 
That's who the third attempt should be. And based on what you saw, because you're looking at the screen at the same time they're intubating, not like, what do you see, what do you see with the direct? You're seeing what they saw is what determines what you're gonna use on that third technique. Pass three, there's no more attempts at laryngoscopy. No matter what, no matter if someone walks in the room, oh, I wanna try, I wanna try, no. No more attempts at laryngoscopy. What we're gonna go is to supraglottic airway placement. And then we're gonna verify that that is getting oxygen in and CO2 out. So I recommend, because it's idiot resistant, the eye gel. No cuff, no remembering what to do. Basically, it rewards ham-handedness. The harder you shove this thing in like an idiot, the better it works. Some of the other LMAs really require finesse and technique. If you push too hard, they get messed up. This one rewards the people that forgot how to put in an LMA. The way I teach this is, eh, that's how you teach an eye gel. And if it's not working, you gotta eh harder. All right, so that's what we recommend. And then you must use end tidal. That's the only way you know is the supraglottic working or not? Because the pulse ox is gonna take a while to come back up. Some called pulse ox lag. You're not gonna see the results right away. If there is not end tidal with your supraglottic placement, then surgical airway. And that's what we're gonna do in the workshops this afternoon. That's easy. It's such an easy algorithm to remember. There's no complicated stuff. You don't need this piece of paper. Three attempts at laryngoscopy, supraglottic, crike. Three attempts at laryngoscopy, supraglottic, crike. You don't need a checklist, you don't need something written on a piece of paper, you don't need the ASA, American Society of Anesthesia algorithm, which is not even remotely possible to memorize. Three attempts at laryngoscopy, supraglottic airway, crike. All right, cut to air if you've not managed to intubate them up until that point. So to bring it home, you do suck at airway if you try to learn the same way as the anesthesiologist. You gotta master one technique You've got to escalate on try number one, not after you already fail. Our patients deserve the best care by the best practitioners. It behooves you to become the best care for your patients. Thank you for your attention. All right. Do, do, do I suck at airway? You do, Andy, you definitely suck at airway. Great, thanks. Uh, I think we should all review something. I saw something in the talk that I, I think it really just merits driving it home. If you could just take your, your in, dominant hand and just hold it up. Everyone do this. There you go. Uh, like got it? Yeah. All right, maybe I suck a little less at airway. There you go. All right, cool. We'll take some uh, questions while we switch out. This is Frank, by the way. Give Frank a big round of applause. Running around like a maniac. Hey Scott, for those of us in training, um, luckily in our ED we've got the C-Mac so we can do this, but for when we're off service on the floors, um, recommendations on keeping that direct skill with having like a, you know, using your Mac, but then having your glide scope ready to go standing by, kind of as your second phase, step two. Yeah. Is that good? So great question. There's actually two questions inherent in that question. Question number one is, let's say my learners only use video and then they're at CT scan or on the floor as you ask, will they have direct skills? And the answer is in my experience and now in the literature, definitively. In fact, if you only trained on standard geometry video for 30 intubations, never did a direct ever and then were at CT scan, you will perform better than the person who did 30 directs looking in the mouth. Your knowledge of anatomy is so dramatically better. Your skill set refinement, your ability of your attending to actually tell you, no, you're going a little too hard on that molecular, you will be dramatically better. The second question, the more difficult question is, if you only have video hyperangulated or standard direct up on the floor, which one should you choose? In my estimation, I would choose the GlideScope hyperangulated, even though it's not optimal. The advantages of video, especially in critically ill patients, in my mind, dramatically outweigh any benefits of the standard geometry. But the real ideal is for hospitals to do away with, if you're only going to have one, it be hyperangulated. I think standard geometry should be the standard, and hyperangulated is the bonus blade.